coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. So we breathe 11,000 liters of air every day, 11,000. And we worry about if our supplement has magnesium stearate in it, or we worry about what sunscreen preservative is in there, or if the chips you know, are organic. These are all good concerns. But let's talk about big things first, air. I'm in my office right now. My desk is 100% wood. My floor is cork. My carpet is wool. My walls are made out of drywall that use a technology that absorb formaldehyde. It's called certainty. And it only costs 20% more. I have windows everywhere so I get natural light. I have double glazed windows to prevent Wi-Fi from coming in. I have metal roofing and metal siding to prevent Wi-Fi, or not Wi-Fi, but like 4G and 5G signals coming in. Our home is a bunker. We have filtered air coming in, being circulated through the building. I practice what I preach. Is it expensive? Yes, but it's what I value. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 394. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you in-depth conversations with health and wellness leaders from around the world. This week, I'm chatting with Dr. Ben Lynch. He's the best-selling author of Dirty Genes and a leader in the field of nutrigenomics. Ben's also president of Seeking Health, an innovative company providing supplements, courses, and tools designed to help people overcome genetic dysfunction and optimize health. After earning his Bachelor of Science in Cell and Molecular Biology, He then obtained a doctorate of naturopathic medicine. Ben and I had a great conversation. Highlights include how the PBS show A Tale of Two Mice dramatically changed the direction of Ben's life, his personal account of volunteering for Mother Teresa, how seeing an Ayurvedic practitioner changed Ben's perspective on health, dirty genes we are born with versus genes that are acting dirty, and why you should get the air and water quality tested in your home. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and share it with somebody in your life and help spread the good word. I thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here we go with Dr. Ben Lynch. Dr. Lynch, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Awesome to be here, Jesse. We're going to have a great chat. And I actually want to start off going into a story that you tell in the introduction of your book. And this is when you first got into genetics. Back in 2007, you're watching a PBS program. It was A Tale of Two Mice. And this triggered something in you. It really hit you in a deep way. So take us back there. Talk about what it was about that program that really struck with you and how that changed things from that point forward. Yeah, actually, uh, I almost broke my my chair and my desk at that (laughs) that moment. I think I forgot that my chair was on wheels. And uh, I got so excited, I put both hands on my desk and I pushed myself backwards and my chair just slammed behind me. I was like, yeah, that's it. Uh, is what I exclaimed after I saw that. So what I saw was basically doesn't really matter for the most part what we're born with in terms of our genetics. You know, we're so paranoid about family history. When you go to the doctor, it's like, yeah, I've got cancer in my family and I've got cardiovascular disease in my family. And when's it going to hit me next? You know, I got alcoholism in my family. And, And when this researcher, she took these mice and she Basically, these mice are genetically bred for cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. That's what they're designed to do for research. And it's nice having mice genetically susceptible to these conditions so they can test, you know, do various procedures on them to see what can help and what can't help and uh, what makes them worse. So the researcher, though, had a very interesting idea. She goes, well, what if we just change their diet, even though that they have these genes? What if we change their diet? Will they even get these conditions at all? So she altered their rat chow, put some vitamins in there, methylated nutrients, i.e. folate, B12, and they went on throughout their life and they never got those things. And I'm thinking, what in the hell? Here we are thinking that, you know, family history is so important uh, in an incoming visit going to your doctor. And now this just completely flipped it on its head. Yeah, it's important to know, but all she did was alter the rat chow with nutrition. And what really blew me away at the end She did this brilliant, simple study, which dramatically changed my whole direction in life. And then she ends with, I have no idea what to do with this information. Drug companies are only up to speed yet. I was like, you gave them nutrition. Drugs are not needed here. Yeah. And so basically what I did is I started implementing what she said, and um, it's really helping people out. So like I mentioned, this was 2007 when you saw that program. But when was this research done? 
And was this groundbreaking research at the time or were other people doing this kind of thing? You know, I don't remember when it was published, but I think it was pretty, pretty soon, you know, when I found it, that it was pretty, pretty recent. You know, Nova did a special and Dana was her first name. And uh, I don't recall exactly you know, the year of that publication. And yeah, it was pretty groundbreaking. And was part of the reason that this hit you so hard and you're so excited about it because you had some of these genes that were dirty, that's your term for them, dirty genes. Was that because you realized that you had these conditions in the family and it created optimism personally for you? Yeah, that was definitely a start. We do have that selfish gene in us. You know, how can I improve myself? How can I sustain myself? You know, it carries on to others and helping others. But yeah, I would say the first one was I did grow up in a family where I kept hearing over and over again, careful with alcohol. When you get older, there's alcoholism in your family. And I witnessed it. And then careful, you know, there's schizophrenia that runs in your family. Be careful. And, and by the way, it hits when you turn, you know, become an adolescent male. And I'm thinking, well, you know, here I am a teenager. Am I just going to wake up one day having schizophrenia? And then a few years later, drinking myself to death, you know, and vomiting up blood and passing out my own puke because I'm an alcoholic. You know, those are not pretty sights as a 17-year-old kid. And uh, it just kept hitting me, you know, over and over again. I kept hearing that alcoholism runs in your family. I was like, I don't even have any desire to drink now. And, you know, I've got some friends of mine who are, are drinking earlier. And I don't like how I feel from alcohol. I don't think I'm going to be an alcoholic. But I kept hearing it. And uh, I hardly drink today. I do have some moments of schizophrenia, but I think we all do at times. You know, schizophrenia is just a label for your, your neurotransmitters not firing properly, in my opinion. It's just a label. So you heard about these traits in your family back when you were a teen. Do you think this is what got you into biology in university and then becoming a naturopath? I grew up on a horse ranch in Central Oregon. My stepmother was an obstetrician gynecologist. So, you know, when I say horse ranch, we had 44 head of horses. Uh, it was a breeding operation. We had newborns, uh, fillies and foals you know, all the time. And so I got to witness birth. I got to witness infertility in horses and, and various treatments. And so here a, a mare can't bear a foal and a vet comes out and does something with her hormones. And next thing we know, you know, a few months later, or, you know, whatever the gestation period for horses, I forget embarrassingly, but, uh, you know, she had a baby. And I'm thinking, what the hell? That's pretty cool. So I, I think growing up on a ranch and working with sick animals or infertile animals, it was really cool seeing how they could be helped. So I had that in me. And then when I was at the University of Washington and even before, conventional medicine failed me routinely. I remember not feeling good from it. You know, I was giving flagell for, you know, some infections I, I got probably from drinking bad water somewhere on a hike. That wrecked my gut. When I was a kid, I used to go play tennis or exercise or even just be outside and my nose would bleed all the time. I mean, my nose was always bleeding. And here I am in a match playing tennis, and I'd have to basically forfeit because my nose would bleed so profusely. And later on, I learned it was histamine. In college, I had basically a growth right behind my nipple in one of my pecs. And I went to the doctor, and he goes, well, are you taking steroids? I mean, I was quite big at the time because I was in the rowing team. But I was definitely not taking steroids. And later, I learned that it was because I was taking ibuprofen, and my estrogen levels were messed. So yeah, there's a lot of life experiences and, you know, I was supposed to have knee surgery because I got injured on the rowing team from overuse, overtraining. You know, I was basically scheduled to have the surgery and one day I leaned over to pick something up and uh, I couldn't get it. It was stuck or something. And I remember after I stood back up, my knee pain was so much better. So I bent over again, even though I didn't have to, and I just stayed in that position and stretched. All I had to do was stretch, Jesse. That's it. No surgery needed. So I think it was just failure after failure. Uh, led me to school. And then obviously being sick in India and being introduced to herbs. I want to get to India here in a bit. Sticking with growing up and you grew up on this horse ranch, was natural medicine part of that for you and your family at that time? At that time, no, it was not. I was under tremendous amounts of stress and anxiety too. Uh, we moved a few times. Parents divorced at a young age. I was three. I had a condition where I actually pulled hair out of my own head. I had this high amount of anxiety. I mean, I, I would comfort myself by pulling hair out of, my, out of my head. I mean, I was severely anemic. You know, I had really bad breath, even though I brushed my teeth. So my gut was a mess. I think that was, was partly an issue. And I may have been somewhat possibly even, you know, on the spectrum. I think we are on the spectrum to some degree, you know, the autistic spectrum, if you want to label it. 
but I am pretty much an introvert. I love researching. I love studying. I love being by myself, but uh, small groups I can handle now. Well, let's lead into India and being overseas. I know during university, you got restless and you went backpacking. I think it was, you took a year during university to go backpacking overseas. So talk about where you went and how that impacted your trajectory. Yeah. So, you know, nutrition was not part of my life until in my early 20s. I didn't think I took a multivitamin. I think I took a Flintstones chewable every now and then, and that was it. And so when I joined the rowing team, my freshman year, I was 165 pounds and six foot four. I left the rowing team because out of frustration, some political uh, rowing stuff, I left at 213 pounds, 4% body fat. So I was big and six foot five. When I was in India, I had multiple exposures, I mean, all the time to environmental pollution and uh, tainted waters, tainted food. I lived on a budget. I think I had about $150 for a, over a month in India. That was it. So everything I did was on the cheap. I mean, I would buy food on the street for, you know, meals for like 10, 15 cents. I remember my cheapest hotel, I think it was a quarter. And I think it was in Rishikesh. And it was basically a cot with a, you know, a thin mattress and cockroaches running all around in a concrete room. It was rough, but uh, I was fine because I was already on the road for an entire year. And so this was the tail end of my trip. So I was pretty travel uh, worn and ready. But I got ill over there and I, I got so ill that I actually lost my vision and fell to the ground and local Indians helped me. Thankfully, they didn't rip me off. There's nothing to rip off though, financially. But what happened is I, I was so ill that a local Indian took me to, he goes, I, I, you can go to our local doctors here. And I was like, I didn't care. I was sweating profusely. I was vomiting. I was you know, explosive diarrhea. I was emaciated. I had no energy. I couldn't do anything. I basically couldn't move. So I went to this doctor and I remember coming in this big concrete room. I don't even think there's any windows. And there's this desk sitting there with a chair on the opposite side. And there's this guy in this white robe sitting there with his hair in a turban or something. And I just put my head on his desk and he grabbed my arm, felt my pulse, told me to stick out my tongue. I did so. And then he listened to my heart or put his hand on my heart or something or on my back. And that was it. And he started writing this prescription. And the Indian guy who led me there said, take this next door and they'll prepare all this stuff for you. And so I go and my head is on the table and I hear this guy preparing. He's talking to me in English. It's pretty good English. I'm just sweating profusely. It's almost like a puddle on the table. I get up, turn around, go about five feet. There's a camel staring at me like, what in the hell are you doing? And I just puke uh, right next to the camel, turn around, come back. I take all these herbs go back to this room where I'm staying, which is a hovel. And the Indian guy tells me what to take. And I, I kid you not, within about 20, 30 minutes, I'm about 80% better. And uh, for fun, you know, I got them right back there on my shelf. I still, to this day, I have some of them left over. So these are leftover herbs that you didn't need to take? Yeah. Gotcha. And were you traveling solo? I was. Yeah. I left the United States and traveled with a good buddy of mine, Chad. We are on the same rowing team at UW. And um, then we hiked all the time and then we worked together in landscaping as well. So we were inseparable and we traveled together, you know, Fiji, New Zealand, and just a tiny bit of Australia. And then um, Australia and all the South Pacific, I did on my own. So how quickly did your health start deteriorating in India and what did it end up being? I know the herbs worked, but what, what was at the root of all that? He said it was a lung infection, but I wasn't coughing anything up. I argued with him. He just motioned me off like this. But he, all he did was feel my pulse in different places. It was Ayurveda. It was Ayurvedic medicine is what, what he practiced on me, ancient Indian methods. And uh, he said it was a lung infection. And honestly, to this day, I still don't know what I took. I'd like to analyze actually those herbs behind me. I should do that. One of them actually tastes like cow dung. It wouldn't surprise me if I actually did ingest cow dung. Uh, I just, I don't know. Some of them were, you know, like a liquid, like, NyQuil or something, but it was all in Hindi or something. I couldn't read it. But uh, that led me to looking for Ayurvedic medicine here in the United States. And I bought a whole bunch of books on it. I went to Ayurvedic practitioners here in Seattle. And it was there that I, I learned about naturopathic medicine because the Ayurvedic practitioner was also a naturopath. And I was like, natural what? what? I didn't even know what that is. But he made me feel phenomenal. Jesse, I went in to see him and 
my tongue had a thick yellow, light green coating on it in my early 20s. And I had eczema and rashes and I was tired all the time. And uh, that thick yellow coating and green coating on a tongue is, you know, denotes uh, gallbladder liver issues. And my genetics are a mess for genetics and gallbladder. But my diet was a mess. My gut was a mess. I had no idea about nutrition. And he put me on these programs and uh, herbs and man, he cleaned me right up. I felt amazing. So this is when you got back home in Seattle. Yes, it took me quite some time to recover. So when you get that diagnosis, you're by yourself over in India. Obviously, you know, you must be scared. What's going through your head at the time? Like you don't, you know, you don't know the language. You're by yourself. Do you contact home and, and talk to your parents and get guidance? Or what, what's going through your mind at that time? Well, I honestly thought I'd have to be medevaced out of there to go to some normal, more developed country. You know, I was, this was in 1996. I don't mean any disrespect to India at all, but here I am with my American perception, right? Thinking that it's where I am. And, and, and uh, I think I was in Jaipur was pretty rough. Yeah, I thought I'd have to be escorted out of there somehow, but I didn't have any money. I didn't even have any money for phone calls. You know, sometimes I would call home, collect, and my parents wouldn't accept the calls. So no, I was on my own, full on. Thankfully, I had that Indian guy there to, to help me out and point me in the right direction because I don't know what would have happened if I didn't have his assistance. So you mentioned within, I think you said an hour or something like that, you were feeling 80% better. How long did it take you to fully recuperate? I don't remember, but I remember um, being strong enough to go on my own feet. And that was a big improvement. I mean, here I was extremely weak and I couldn't even do anything. I was actually volunteering at one of the Prem Dons for Mother Teresa and her sisters at the time. So I got healthy enough to go back and work and make the walk and the commute to do that. You know, it was probably just a mile, but I was strong enough to do it. And then one day I, a homeless guy came up to me and he was begging that I buy infant formula for his daughter. This was in Calcutta. And uh, there's tons of professional beggars and you don't give money to these beggars because it, it's, it's actually, it's like a mafia ring. It's a mess. But I actually saw his little baby and I saw his wife and, uh, you know, I bought the infant formula and gave it to him and it was, it was like five bucks. It was expensive and, uh, I could not afford it, but I, I did it. And, and he shook my hand and I got scabies right where he shook my hand. And I didn't know at the time I started scratching and on my face and elsewhere. And I went to, to go volunteer and, uh, the nuns looked at my hand and she's like, stay there, gave me a bottle of some toxic stuff. And she goes, go away, get out of here. So I didn't infect people. And I got on the airplane and was treating myself with, <laughs> with this stuff on the airplane. And, and a funny story is I could not even get to the airport. I was so poor. There was a departure tax. I think it was like 10 bucks or 20 bucks. I managed to have that. I kept it. I knew I had to get that. Otherwise, I was going to leave the country, but I couldn't afford a taxi. And I heard some Israelis talking down the hall that they were taking a taxi to go to the airport and when. And I ran out there and I just grabbed my backpack. That's all I had. Just grabbed my backpack and I said, I'm going with you. Is that cool? And they said, yeah. And they covered my taxi. So when you got scabies and then went to Mother Teresa and her sisters, they gave you this treatment and that was the end of your trip overseas? That was basically, yeah. And it was near the end, which was good. I mean, I was out of money. I mean, I was legit out of money. I couldn't stay anymore. My visa wasn't run out, but I was out. I came back to the United States with 80 cents and three different currencies in my pocket. Just scraping by. Talk about what that volunteering experience was like. It was a phenomenal experience. I'm glad I didn't come straight from the United States to that. I was already in Southeast Asia for five months. I was poor myself. I was emaciated myself. I was sick myself. So I could relate to some degree. I mean, these people were way, way, I mean, heaps sicker than I am. It was almost like I was in a Hitler concentration camp. They were so emaciated. And uh, you can't tell age with, when their people are so emaciated like that. But imagine walking into a, a grocery store like, you know, Safeway or Albertsons or a Home Depot and having it empty and it's full of cots. Just imagine cots and then people in gowns laying on them with no blankets because they don't need them. It's so damn hot in Calcutta. And then next to them, there's bedpans and these bedpans are overflowing with loose stool. And uh, there's piss and crap and diarrhea all over the floor. And, uh, you know, they get up and they are motioned to go to some area, other area. And my job was to 
get their bedding and, and take off the sheets and take the bedpans and clean all that, but mop the floor and put their cots away. And then after I did that, I went to this other area where we washed their clothes and there was this massive cauldron, like a witch black cauldron, huge, heated with fire and uh, stirred with a stick. Could you not? And then there was this big crank that the crank turned and the cauldron turned with it and this dirty water pulled out. And then they pulled these clothes out with a stick on this long table and the volunteers were beating the clothes with sticks. And then they were thrown to another counter, which is where I was. And then we dipped them in some, you know, solution or just rinsed them and then beat them again and then wrung them and then hung them out to dry on the clothesline. And then after we did that, then it was helping the nurses with the patients. You know, they get shaved, they get their haircuts, they be medicated, but I don't even know with what medications, maybe it was just herbs because Mother Teresa didn't allow a lot of stuff over there. I remember most vividly the amount of stuff I saw uh, in terms of disease was amazing. I mean, people, this one gentleman I worked on, he had a stick in his mouth. We laid him down on a table, one person holding one arm, one person holding another arm, and, you know, another person on each leg. A nurse was there on his foot, and um, she was pulling out a maggots from his foot. Jesse, I could see all of his tendons in his foot moving. There was no skin. It was like a robotic foot. It was, it was awful, and he was screaming screaming, biting on this stick, and we're holding him down while they're removing all this detritus and dead skin off his foot. It was brutal. We could take a break, and I'd be sitting out there with these other volunteers who are actually professional nurses or doctors um, from other countries, and, and they're just ripping Mother Teresa apart, just pissed. And uh, it was an interesting perspective because you never hear that, right? You never hear how good she is, and she was a saint, right? And thankfully, I got to meet her before she passed. But uh, they were pissed off because she did not allow them to be put on painkillers. So it was tough working on these individuals in so much pain. What was it like meeting Mother Teresa? I can't put it to words. So she went to church all the time, obviously, I think every day. And so I went to her church, I walked in and it was full of you know people, mostly volunteers. And she was just in the back in a wheelchair. I think she died six months after I met her. And uh, she was in a wheelchair, wheeled around by one of the sisters. But after mass, the volunteers lined up against this wall in a hallway. And she wheeled by us all, shook our hands and gave us this like business card with one of her poems on it, which I still have today. She just shook her hand and, and gave us the card. I just remember she was extremely frail. And uh, her hand was very dry, warm, soft, and you could tell, very, very hard working hands. You can tell a lot about a person from their hands. I agree. Do you find yourself thinking back to that time often and being grateful for all you have and being inspired by that work you're doing? At the time, no. Years later, yes. It's interesting when you're living in the moment, something as powerful as that, right? You don't really appreciate that moment because it's a moment. It's you're there, you're living, and you're breathing it. And then you're pulled away and you don't really realize that, wow, I actually got to to meet Mother Teresa. And I got to have these experiences. So I'm almost a little teary right now. But uh, it really shaped who I am. And it's allowed me to uh, understand and have perspective, which so many of us don't have. Perspective is very, very important. And if we do not put ourselves in uh, painful situations or difficult situations, we can't have that perspective. And then if you don't have that perspective, how can you have empathy? I think I'm very fortunate to have done that. I think perspective is huge. And the challenge I find with perspective is how do you maintain that day to day? Because it's so easy to listen to something like, you know, your story you're sharing right now, or, you know, have certain things that clue us in as we go through our days. But having that perspective on a regular basis and being present is just so important. So do you have any tricks that you do to keep that top of mind day to day? I do. So I came back remember, from India with 80 cents in, in three different currencies. And I remember my buddies picked me up at the airport in Seattle. They walked right by me. They didn't recognize me. I had long hair down to my shoulders. I was super skinny. I was wearing the Indian clothing. And uh, they just walked right by me. Went outside and I, I was picked up in my buddy's Saab, this old Saab. I went to, to get in the car on the driver's side, but that was the passenger side. And he was like, dude, you're not driving. I was like, oh, sorry. And then I had to pee. So I just lifted up, you know, my shirt and pulled my 
Indian pants down. I started pissing right there in the public parking lot with people around. He's like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> uh, so, and then we, we get on the freeway. I look at the roads. It's like there's no potholes and cars are in their lane and there's street lights, and there's paint on the roads and the cars aren't all beat up and there's no plume of black exhaust. The city, the skyline of Seattle comes up as you're going north on the freeway. And I don't know if you've seen Seattle at night, but it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I felt like I was in some fairy tale land. So I always go back. I always put myself back into hard situations to remember the good situations. And I purposely traveled in tough areas. So after I came back from that year abroad, I finished my, my school. I, I got pre-med, uh, cell molecular biology at UW. I finished my degree. And then um, life would become normal. And it did get normal. And I'd start complaining about certain things. I would check myself. And then I would put myself on a plane in the winter. And I'd go back to these you know, Eastern Europe countries. And I would get cold again. I'd live on the cheap again. I would you know, sleep in inexpensive areas. And you know, eat off the street and you know, take local transportation, which sucked, and immerse myself in an area where they didn't speak English, so I'd have to struggle. I think there's too much focus on comfort. I think that's inconvenience. And I think when there's too much comfort and too much convenience, people get complacent. They don't end up doing the work and they expect everything to make them comfortable and everything to be convenient. And when it's not, their perspective on that shifts and they become super selfish, super impatience. If you do the opposite, if you have the perspective that I've got it made right now, and you remember how hard it was when you put yourself, you know, sleeping on the, in the sides of the streets and being woken up by cops because you can't sleep there. I've been there. My goal for my boys is to do the same thing, but no one wants to go from comfort to discomfort. So how do you do that? And as a parent, I'm trying to figure that out because I want my boys to do what I did. I didn't do it immediately. I transitioned, right? So, I, I mean, I started in Fiji and then, you know, I lived, you know, in a hut, a grass hut for a week with the local villagers who had no running water, no electricity. They cooked with fire. It was an amazing experience. So I tasted that. And, you know, then I was back to travel and, and all that. But I gradually made my travel harder and harder, but without conscious thought. It just became harder because I was running out of money. And you mentioned after you got back from that big trip, the trip in India, well, more than India, but ended in India with you being sick, that over the years, you would go back and travel and, and that would reignite in you that discomfort and you'd have that appreciation for what you have back here over in the West. So I'm just curious these days, is that something you continue to do or do you have a pivot from that, a different way you go about putting yourself in difficult situations to maintain that level of gratitude? Great question. So in my travels, I met my wife, who was from a very poor part of Estonia. And uh, who would have thought that I would have found my wife and you know my love in, in this remote town, Narva, Estonia, bordering Russia, next to Ivan the Terrible's castle? No idea. That's how the world works sometimes. Her parents are really poor. So when we go to Russia and have been multiple times, you know, we live it. They just have a few hundred dollars a month of, of income. You know, they grow their own food and they're, they're, they make it happen and they're happy. You know, and the happiest people are the poorest people I've met, you know, in terms of financial stuff. You can be poor financially, but rich in everything else. Seeing that was really, really cool. I mean, here I was in, in Calcutta seeing these huts lining the railroad track in Calcutta and the trains would come constantly, constantly. And they weren't even huts. They were made out of plastic bags and cardboard and, and scraps of metal. And people would come out in button-down t-shirts, pressed, hair brushed, their comb in their back pocket. You know, they were clean and they were they took pride in themselves still, even though they were living in these garbage cans, basically. And that really, really impressed me. So what I do now, I live my memories. I travel in comfort. You know, now I'm 46 and I'm comfortable. But I comfort is dangerous because if you become too comfortable, you become too complacent and then you start complaining. And so the moment I start complaining, I just check myself. And then I also, what I do, Jesse, is I push myself every day. I do things that scare the hell out of me. You know, when I made our genetic test for our company, that was a seven-figure investment and terrifying. So it's a different type of 
fear. It's a different type of challenge, but it still is discomfort. So you got to keep putting yourself into uncomfortable situations. And it's something I'm always trying to push my boys to do as well. You mentioned making that big investment for your company in the genetic testing. Do you have other examples day to day that you do that put you in that state of fear that maybe aren't as extreme or extravagant? Yeah. So I own a supplement company, right? And people are trusting me to the extent that they will invest in a supplement, buy it from my company, we will ship it to them. They'll trust that we're storing it properly, that we're checking it for pesticides and herbicides and metals and and that I have the potencies right and the formulation right. And they're swallowing it. They're ingesting it. That's a big deal. You know, with every day, every supplement, every lot is stressful. We demand high quality from our manufacturers. I mean, I could just be spewing this nonsense, right, as any business owner would do. But no, it's a challenge. And it's a challenge to, to work with these manufacturers because they got comfortable and they got complacent. And the standards for them are the standards of their customers. And so here we are as an outlier customer that demands this extra level of due diligence and checks and balances and and communication and testing, but they're not used to that. So it's a constant push. Our customers are, you know, they're pissed off at us at times because we're out of stock more than most companies. What we fail to communicate is why we're out of stock. Didn't meet label claim. We couldn't find a clean enough ingredient. The uh, manufacturer could not get their humidity control done good enough. So we could not get the product stable enough. You know, these are the types of things that we weigh. It's like, do we run out of stock because the quality didn't meet our standards? Or are we just like every other company? It's like, oh, it's good enough. Let's sell it. These are not terrifying things, but they're decisions every day, which, you know, impact, you know, your decisions and impact other people. And how do you make the most of it? You know, we don't put on the website out of stock because of this or, you know, or that. It just says out of stock. And maybe we should give them, you know, increased awareness. Manufacturing supplements is not easy, especially during COVID era. I can only imagine. And speaking of integrity, my family and I totally appreciate the integrity of seeking health. And and speaking of trust that you talked about and having people trust you and, and what you're putting in those supplements, I mentioned to you before we jumped on the call that we just had a baby eight and a half months ago. And the prenatal we actually chose that my wife started taking before we tried to get pregnant all through her pregnancy, and now she's continuing to take even eight and a half months later, is seeking health. So we do our due diligence and and look for the best. And we're just so thankful that you know you put the time and, and effort into putting out such a quality product because it is the best. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and I, I thank you and I appreciate your trust. And it's, it's awesome that you know, I, I support your family and, and so is the team. And that's why I always re- remind the team, you know, we're, we're upwards of 30 uh, team members now at Seeking Health. And, and uh, you know, we have difficult days. And, and I just say, hey, you know, always remember what we're doing. Bigger picture here. And so that's what I always have them do is, you know, I sent an email out just last week for the first time from me personally to a list of, uh, you know, thousands of people. And it was the first time since I've written, written an email and customer service got, you know, over 100, you know, thank you letters. So that was pretty cool. There's a lot of joy and, and warm fuzzies with this business too. But, you know, a little information on that prenatal, that was three years in formulation, Jesse, three years, because I would read research and I'd compare it to other prenatals and, you know, do this and look for safety and put it down and read more research. And it was three years of, of stewing and chewing and, and fear to finally release it. And uh, what I do nowadays more so is I do I have the same process. I will formulate, I'll sit, I'll stew, I'll go back. And uh, now what I also do is I, I will test it on numerous people to see if I get the result that I want. With the multivitamin, it's, you know, it's going to be a go. So, you know, with seeking out prenatal, you know, I formulated that. And I was like, all right, I'm super confident about this now. But I had no idea it was going to be as effective as it is, as it's showing. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Ben to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. Organifi Immunity contains 10 immune health supporting superfoods and one delicious glass. Each box contains 14 single serve packets that are easy to take with you anywhere. You can mix one packet with 8 to 10 ounces of water once or twice daily. One serving is great for daily immune health support and you can take two servings if you're feeling under the weather. Organifi Immunity contains mushroom beta glucan from Rishi Mushrooms 
which acts fast, quickly reducing symptoms of sickness by over 30%. It also contains acerola cherry, orange, ginger, turmeric, baobab fruit, Mediterranean olive leaf extract, and whole food derived zinc. It's organic, gluten-free, soy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. And these are all things I love to see in a product. As a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimalpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that's ultimalpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Give Organifi Immunity a try. This delicious orange juice blend will have you hooked. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Paleo Valley. I absolutely love the naturally fermented 100% grass-fed beef sticks from Paleo Valley. They're the perfect clean snack for on the go. You can keep a couple stuffed in your purse, backpack, or drawer at work for when you get hungry between meals. Paleo Valley uses old world methods of fermenting their sticks, so they're shelf stable without the use of chemicals or questionable ingredients. Virtually all other similar snack stick products use GMO corn-based citric acid encapsulated in hydrogenated oils to process their products. And thanks to the fermentation process, each stick contains gut-friendly probiotics. They come in five flavors, original, jalapeno, summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, and teriyaki. My two favorites are original and jalapeno, but they're all incredible. As a listener of the show, you get 15% off your Paleo Valley purchase by going to ultimalpodcast.com slash Paleo Valley. Again, that's ultimalpodcast.com slash Paleo Valley. Pick up some of the 100% grass-fed beef sticks from Paleo Valley. They're the ultimate snack on the go. And now back to my chat with Ben. And I want to come back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago about your boys and how you want that same experience for them that you had being overseas and doing that travel and living through those hard times. So as somebody who's a new dad, I don't have to think about this quite yet, but I'm curious, somebody who's a little further along the parenting journey than I am, how do you go about doing that in a way that's not, you know, forceful and coming down on the kids, but showing them this is something that was really beneficial to me in forming who I am today. Living it, doing it. As parents, we always want to have the nest as comfortable as possible. We want them, as, you know, the cleanest bed, the most organic foods, safe cars, and safety is great. But it, it creates this artificial bubble. When they leave the nest, they don't have any calluses. And it's something I still need to do better. Taking them to Russia, they get pretty calloused. And they live there for months you know, during the summers, because I was still in med school, and I'd be grinding away at school, and my wife would fly away, and I'd be in tears, and they'd be in tears, but I wouldn't see them for months. But they had this amazing experience, you know, living out in the country, and uh, using well water with a bucket, you drop down and playing in the rivers and playing outside. So I would just say through experiences and, and travel in places and do things that that increase discomfort. And when you have the discomfort, you know, your kids watch you. Your little one, how old is your little one right now? Eight and a half months. Boy? A uh, girl. A girl. So she's watching you. Every move, watching you, your wife, and any pets that you have, others, and they're learning through your actions. And it's amazing when someone says something later in life to you when your kids are older, and they say, God, they act just like you. They do the exact same things that you do, the same mannerisms and all these things. So be very mindful of your actions. You know, if you're screaming at your wife, well, what's going to happen to their wife, you know, or to their girlfriends? Probably the same thing. You know, we all have moments, but you got to check yourself. Our youngest is 12 and he is so caring. The amount of empathy that Theo has is off the charts. And Matthew too, he's a middle boy. And both of them won, I forget the name of the award, like the most caring kid in their grade. And I didn't even know it was a thing. But Matthew won it and then Theo won it three years later. I was like, wow. You know, so they, they have that built into them. So we're doing something right with that. Or it's just their genetics. But I think environment has a big role for that. Tasman's also super caring as well, just not to their extent. But we're going to go to India. I'm going to take them to Auschwitz and Birkenau. You know, we're going to travel on the cheap. You know, and then I'm going to encourage them to do the same. And uh, I'm actually really encouraging all my boys now. Tasman's going to be 18 here in a couple of weeks or a few weeks. You know, he's applying to some colleges, but uh, I'm really encouraging him not even to go to college because his entire life, he's been told what to do, when to do, and how to do it. I want him to 
get on a plane and just figure that entire thing out himself, where he wants to go, how he wants to go, live by the, the law of the land, wherever you are, be respectful, but you got to figure out where you're staying, what you're eating, how you're going to get there. What are you going to do? How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to get money? You know, sounds like a great plan to me. Yeah. You just go, but I will go with him in the beginning. And I also want him to go with a close friend as well. Like I did with Chad and uh, New Zealand is a super safe place to travel. So hopefully this whole COVID thing lifts. Um, so that starts happening. So Ben, I want to come back to your story. The part where you come back from India, you mentioned you ended up seeing this Ayurvedic practitioner. Come back to that, go into more detail what that was like and how that transformed your perspective. Yeah. So, you know, I'm living in Seattle with, you know, just a couple of roommates. My parents are still in Oregon. As you asked before, I had no introduction into herbs or, or nutrition at all. In fact, the first nutrition book I ever bought was in New Zealand. I still have it it's behind me, uh, How to Juice and What to Juice. Who wrote that one? Oh, boy. Cool that you hung on to it. Yeah. Dr. D.R. Gala, Dr. Deeran Gala, and Dr. Sanjay Gala. So, modern man has drifted far away from nature. He leads a hectic life full of tension, inhales polluted air, drinks polluted water, eats junk food, and indulges all sorts of excesses. No wonder ill health is on the rise. I don't know why it caught my eye, but it did. It's a great book. Juice Diet for Perfect Health. So I just didn't feel right. And I, I had my own landscape company. So I came back from India and I made money before I even left by working on the weekends. I started kind of making them have my own clientele for landscaping, pruning and, and clean up and just basic stuff. And so I got back from the trip and my buddies wanted to tie into some of my clients and start a landscape company. So we did. And uh, there's three of us. And so we started landscaping right away. And so I started making some money. And then I had some of that money, but I was just super sick. And I remember I went and saw this doctor and it was very expensive for me, super expensive. Didn't have insurance and uh, parents didn't pay for anything, didn't ask them ever for anything. So it was expensive. But what I did is I just trust him. Gary Vaynerchuk was talking about this just the other day on a, on a podcast he did, or just a snippet. He goes, why is it that people have to earn your trust? You know, why can't you just trust out of the gate first until someone, you know, does something wrong and then you kind of lose the trust? But why can't you just go into the relationship with some inherent trust that they are there to support you? So I just walked in with some trust that this, you know, Indian guy, this doc was going to help me out and he's an expert and he's going to put his fingers on me like this other guy did in, in Jaipur and look at my tongue. Super weird not from my lifestyle at all, but I'm going to trust it. Yeah, it's expensive money. I didn't really have, but I did it because I really valued feeling good. And so what he did is he, he checked my pulse and he started telling me what it, he felt. And he said, you have a lot of liver congestion. You have a lot of deep internal anger. Digestion's a mess. Uh, you're very damp inside and uh, all sorts of words I've never heard of before. You know, your spleen chi is this and your your kidney chi is that. And you're it's like, wow, all right, your dosha is this and you're more pitta, you're less kapha. And I, whoa. So he, he gave me these herbs, which he had direct from India. He, he had me go into a sauna. He told me what to eat, what not to eat. He put me on this basically a cleanse. So I bought a couple of supplements for 60 bucks a pop. He told me to, how to take it, when to take it, why to take it. And then come back and do an oil massage with special oil that is appropriate for my dosha. So I did all this whole thing. And I remember at the end of this like three week cleanse that I did with him, I woke up one morning, like five in the morning. I'm not a morning person. I had zero bad breath. My breath felt, I had no coating on my tongue. My teeth had no film. I was energized. I wasn't hungry. The amount of food I ate could fit in my hand and I was full and I was energized. I didn't need uh, a whole bunch of food anymore. My energy was amazing all day long. I didn't have that crash. It's like, wow. And I remember Cinco de Mayo came and that's when I went out, I had a drink and I had some pizza. I lost everything I gained. After I felt that good, I just wanted to maintain it, right? And I dirtied my jeans. I had a beer or something. And then I had pizza and it just wrecked me. 
and it just slowed me right back down again. Did you find that because you had done that work, things came back to the new normal pretty quickly? I think what happened is I fell into a rut because once you taste those foods again, they spike your dopamine, they're convenient, they're fast. I was making all my salads before, dedicating more time in the kitchen. And then I started you know, not doing that as much. And then you start going down that path of convenience and speed so you can go to work faster. But at the end of the day, is it really faster when you're slower and you need more stimulants and more junk food? So I got off track. And then I went back on track and I did as fast on my own the next spring. I bought his supplements again. I didn't do the Panchakarma. I didn't do the sauna because it was expensive. I tried to take shortcuts. I maintained working because I, I wanted to make more money. Whereas last time I rested more. And so I wasn't eating enough. I was burning my muscle. I was eating my own muscle because I wasn't eating sufficient protein. And I was doing it wrong. And I made myself worse from that fasting and that cleansing. It took me probably a year and a half or more to recover from that. So a lot of us are hearing about fasting, intermittent fasting, extended fasting, water fasting, one meal a day types of things, ketogenic diet that, carnivore diet this. I mean, the amount of information at your fingertips with all these different podcasts are amazing and awesome. But at the same time, be very, very careful because you can get really hurt. And when it comes to intermittent fasting, you're actually a fan of doing a 12 to 16 hour fast as a maintenance, part of a healthy lifestyle, right? Yeah, I do that almost every day. One of my weak points to this day is still eating, you know, at nine or 10 at night, but I won't eat typically until, you know, noon, you know, the next day. I did have a smoothie this morning at about 11 and my last meal last night was probably nine. So that's 14 hours. So not bad. And I eat when I'm hungry in the morning and I eat when I'm hungry, period. But there's a time of the day sometimes where I eat because I want to eat because it tastes good. I want to have a crunch or I, I crave something. I'm not hungry anymore, but I crave something. And so identifying the craving versus hunger is super important. And we're all, you know, I don't want to say guilty of it. You know, you don't want to put guilt on your actions, but I, I'm aware that I'm eating something that I'm craving and I don't beat myself up for it. I just say, okay, well, I'll just fast or I'll do something else. And I've learned to, to not make myself feel bad from eating something that is not nutritious for my body. It's work for my body to do. I've come to accept that it's okay to do that as long as I don't do it all the time and I know how to support myself to get out of it. And that's what I try to convey in Dirty Genes too. You read a lot of these health books out there. The author makes it sound like they're perfect. You come in their house and their fridge is like, how do you always eat like that? And how is your environment so perfect? And how do you go out to always these perfect restaurants and you always get the perfect food and you have the perfect life and you never expose yourself to this and you use the perfect oils and everything is perfect. It's not sustainable. I put that real picture in the book so people can understand I'm not perfect. It's okay to have dirty jeans as long as you know how to clean them up. That's my goal for people. And I think a whole nother layer on that, you talk about the authors and, and showing what a perfect picture would look like is social media. And we're all guilty of this to some point where, you know, we fill the fridge after going to the farmer's market on a Saturday and we're inspired by what we did and, and how the fridge looks and excited. And we take a picture and show that on Instagram, but we don't show, you know, on a Thursday before market day again, when it's depleted and maybe we're going to get some takeout that's, you know, maybe it's still healthy-ish, but it's not what's being portrayed online. So I think the combination of both of those things, and again, podcasts too, where different experts come on and share what the ideal would be. We have to be real like you're doing here and explain that there's the goal and then there's the realistic approach and what's acceptable. And for me, a big thing, a big part of that is making a conscious decision, which is kind of what you were talking about before, where if you decide you're going to have a snack at night, you know, you're doing that consciously and you understand what the consequences are of that decision. And I'll do that too. Maybe it's a Saturday night and, and my wife and I decide to have a, you know, a healthy snack while we're watching a Netflix documentary or something like that. And I had maybe planned on intermittent fasting and, and I was just getting into a fast, but there is so many layers to this health and wellness thing that I get a certain level of my well-being boosted by enjoying a snack with my wife on a Saturday night. So 
Again, I'm saying a lot of different things here. Being conscious of the decision, I think, is just so important and realizing that it's good to put the goal out there of what ideal would look like, but don't expect to live that 24-7 because that's just not sustainable. It's not. The goal is key. The term goal is, is tough. I was reading some book on personal growth and all that, and, and they talked about the, the word goal and the, the connotations it has. And I think companies even talk about goals. And maybe it's a business book. You know, don't name them goals, but name, name them objectives. But I, I don't know if that's even the right word. You know, because we make New Year's resolutions and New Year's goals and all that. So I don't know what the word is, but whatever resonates for you as the individual is, is what matters ultimately. And word choice really, really matters. So like when I said, when I took time to do this, I caught myself. Sachin Patel in Toronto, you know, of Living Proof, he had a great post. He's a word wizard. He had a great post. He goes, you don't take time. You don't make time to do something. You don't have time to do something. Whatever you do, you're dedicating time to do it. So don't come in to me and you know, my kids come up to me and it's like, oh, I didn't have time to do that. No, we all have 24 hours in an entire day or, or 12. So you don't come to me and say you didn't have time. You didn't value it and you didn't dedicate time to do what you know was asked of you. You valued to do something else. And the consequence of making that decision wasn't significant enough for you to do what you should have done. So you chose to play video games versus getting your homework done or going for a walk with the dog. So don't tell me you didn't have time to walk the dog. You had time. You chose not to have time. So, and I hear this all the time when I worked with patients. Oh, I didn't have time to do that, doc. I, you know, my day, day got busy. No, you had time. Don't tell me you didn't have time. Oh, I didn't have money to spend on that. Well, you actually do. You need to sit down and really consciously figure out where you're spending those monies on what you do value because whatever I'm offering you right now, you don't value. And so you say you don't have the money. So when people tell me the strategy is expensive, they're telling me that they don't value strategy. And that's okay. But just don't tell me that it's too expensive. You just don't feel the value in it. And that is totally cool. But you have to know where your values are. That is really, really important. And as business owners, you need to have core values on the walls of your business and they're your core values. They're not your teams. You don't sit in a huddle and figure this out. The CEO of Mind Valley, he's like, you know, I first, when I started my company, you know, we sat in this big circle and we, we created core values of, of business and it didn't do well. And it didn't do well until I implemented my own core values and the team joined who had the similar core values as I do. And then we blossomed and, and culture becomes out of that. So core values are, are really, really important. And if you don't have core values that are communicated in your family, that's going to be a big problem. Never assume is a big core value in our family. Don't assume that your mom you know, did that or don't assume that your brothers do this. You ask or you clarify and you always acknowledge. Always say okay or no or say something after something is said that you registered and heard it. Acknowledge it. Like when you're talking on radios, 10-4 right? Acknowledge that you got the message. Makes sense to me. So coming back to your story, Ben, when did you end up going back to college and finishing your degree? So I finished my junior year at UW. I left, I think in November, I skipped fall quarter of my senior year. I went to this, this school and I, I wrote a letter that I'm taking off for an entire year. And first it started out as three months. And I talked to my parents about it and they're all excited. And I looked at a map and then it was five months because I was in Fiji and New Zealand. And I was like, oh, Australia's right there. Then it was six months because Australia is so big. And then it was nine months because Indonesia is there. And I was like, screw it. I'm just going to be gone a year. Make it simple. So that's how that evolved. So I, I got back in 96 and I just went right back to school. I re-enrolled right away. But when I re-enrolled right away, I also started my own landscape company with a couple other guys. So here I am sitting in class being lectured to as I shared with you earlier, I want my boys to figure out how to think for themselves, do things on the, by themselves, and experience the world how they want to live in the world versus being told what to do. So now I'm, I'm out of that environment where I'm thinking for myself, making decisions for myself, and I'm sitting in a, in a chair listening to my professors tell me what I should learn, how I should learn it, when I should regurgitate the facts and take a test, and when I should go back to class again. I struggled, man. It was a grind to finish that year, but I did. And then you had naturopathic school after that with that mindset. 
I did, but I took, I didn't rush to school. So here I am sitting in class and my grades suck. You know, I'm in study groups and I'm trying to get back in the groove of things because I was a, I was a 4.0 student at, in high school. I was valedictorian, you know, in a private school. It was tough. And I walked into UW as a freshman with 30 college credits already under my belt. So, I mean, I was a full on nerd and here I am getting bad scores. But I remember talking to my classmate, you know, in biology and he's like, I said, dude, you're kicking my ass on these tests. He goes, yeah, but you have a business. I said, yeah, but I'm, I'm doing so poorly. He goes, yeah, but you have a business. And I didn't get what he was saying. And he was always so impressed that I had a business. I was so impressed that he was doing well in school. And then I graduated with having nine employees already in my landscape business. And we had multiple, you know, crews and multiple different jobs. And, you know, I'm running the, the business and I'm running, you know, I'm getting my, my schoolwork done, kind of. I remember walking out to my last class. To this day, I pushed open the door, carrying my backpack. And I was like, wow, I'm done. I'm finished. I don't need to go back here anymore. I was so relieved that I couldn't stand school anymore. I hated it. And I don't use that word hate very often. I don't like that word hate. But I, I was done with school. Graduated in 97. I enrolled at Bastyr in 2002. So five years of running my own landscape design construction firm. So we went from mowing lawns and pruning trees and you know cutting grass and weeding and stuff to full on learning how to do irrigation installations, lighting, irrigation, retaining walls, you know, stone stairwells, waterfalls, ponds, you name it. You know, like I said, you always put yourself in those uncomfortable situations. And so I was always leaning myself into learning something new and being scared to do it. I told myself if I got a big six figure landscape design construction job that was waterfalls and ponds and streams and stone stairways and irrigation and lighting and all the whole thing. I would reach my pinnacle and I'd be done. And I did that. And so that was my, my biggest job. And uh, he was a neurosurgeon in Issaquah. Great, great guy. But I remember stepping off the excavator one day. I couldn't breathe. I had like a huge 500 pound object on my chest in front of me and behind me. I was, felt like I was pinned. I couldn't inhale. I felt like I was having a heart attack right then and there. And my buddy, Chad, who I traveled with, was working on that job. And he was talking to me and I have a normal conversation. I'm just staring at him. Couldn't speak. I couldn't breathe. And I remember, oh my God, am I going to fall over dead right here? The stress of that six-figure job was immense and I was just done. So that's when I went back to Bastyr and I actually found Bastyr. And I, my parents were pissed that I was quitting landscape construction because I had you know, a fleet of trucks that were amazing. I had referrals coming in left and right. I was making six figures as a young 20-year-old as income. You know, I was doing very well, but I was not happy. And I was, I was, my back was hurting. I was going to probably blow a disc in my back from all the physical work of moving these boulders. And my parents were pissed off that I was going to go to Bastyr University. And um, I didn't care. I just kept saying, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I'm going to do it. So you went to Bastyr and took naturopathic medicine. Yeah. What year did you graduate that? I started in 02 and I graduated in 07. So you can complete your degree in four, five, or six years. So here I am all macho. I'm going in and it's like, I'm going to get this done in four years. Uh, uh, my wife and I, you know, we find out she's pregnant, you know, and I was like, well, you know, she can't work. Bless her heart. She worked all the way up until like the eighth month. So then I was having to work and go to med school. And here you can't cut corners on your classes, right? I mean, you're in med school. And by the way, last year, I remember sitting in the admissions office and you're like, you know, your grades were really good until your last year and you, you were doing not so good in those classes. And usually we see it the other way around. We usually see students struggling in the beginning and then doing well at the end. You did the opposite. What happened? So I told them what happened, you know, the story of what I shared with you all. And um, they let me in. They said, we also letting you in because you have great business experience and we don't see that. And you need to combine business in and medicine in order to succeed. And I said, all right, well, good. So they let me in, thankfully, even though my grades my last year were crap. So I was good thinking on past year's part. Yeah, but I finished in five years and our first son, Tasman, was born first quarter, first year during finals week. <laughs> so I, I failed my cadaver exam. So I had to retake an entire quarter of gross anatomy all over again in the lab, which was good because that was a, an amazing experience to be able to work on, you know, 20 some different cadavers and, and see that and how amazing the human body is. But it was 2007 when you came out as a naturopathic physician? Correct. And it yeah. didn't take you long to have that PBS program come into your life and, and change your whole trajectory soon after graduating. 
Yeah. And first quarter, first year at Bastyr, they wheeled in, remember those old things in school? They had the cart with the big old massive TV, the big thick TVs, and then the VCR underneath all the wires. Oh, and, yeah. And then they, they put the, the VHS tape in there and you got all the lines on the wall and you know, the TV trying to, you know, you had to adjust the, what they call that? The tracking? Tracking, you had to adjust the tracking to get it just right. Watching Bruce Lipton, Dr. Bruce Lipton talk about how your perception of the environment influences your genes. I remember I, I was a back row guy in class. And here I was, I was in the front row. The TV was right in front of me and I just was glued to every word he said. That was my first, first ever realization that we were in control of our genes and how they express themselves. And then that Nova thing hit. You hear something the first time, you're like, oh, okay. And then years later, when it hits you again, it's like, okay, now I need to listen to this. I'm always learning. I'm always putting myself in, in uh, to learn. My desk is covered with research papers and I read it and research it almost every day. I'm very, very current. I'm so current that I'm ahead of most people where people are. So, and that's a problem because I, I leave and I, I didn't realize that until I was doing a presentation for Brennan Penwarden, this Australian educational company for health professionals. He's like, Ben, your information is so advanced. It's so far ahead of where these health professionals are that you need to like slow down and stop reading, dude, and, you know, simplify what, what you're coming up with. And uh, he was right. It's hard for me because I, I love learning, and but being able to teach and simplify these difficult concepts is very valuable. Well, let's talk about how life, you know, took a turn for you, the way you practice, the way you studied once you watched A Tale of Two Mice. So talk about from that moment on how that opened things up for you. And was genetics a passion for you at all before coming across that documentary? I had genetics at UW, uh, Genetics 101. I despised that class. It was genetic engineering, you know, genetic modification of mice. I mean, we're putting, you know, tails on their heads and ears on their butt and, you know, changing their fur color with genes. And I had no interest in that. So making them resistant to some, you know, antibiotic and then giving them certain antibiotics and then it didn't help them, right? So it was all through genetic engineering and modification. It was like, this is not interesting to me. This is not right. But what happened is when I was in clinic at Bastyr, and when I was working with other doctors, people would walk in with fibromyalgia or they'd walk in with heavy metal exposures or, or known, you know, high arsenic or high mercury. Then they'd be put on these protocols and certain supplements and sauna protocols that were always the same. And it didn't matter if it was a male or female or she was 40 or 60. It was, here's a supplement, go on the sauna for this duration, this long. And I noticed some people got better. Some people had no benefit and some people got way worse. And so here I am thinking, Early on as a student, they're coming in with a specific condition, maybe fibromyalgia or Parkinson's or schizophrenia, and we're putting them on this. I mean, it's naturopathic medicine. You're supposed to be supporting the individual and individualized therapies and natural therapies, but we're putting them all in these buckets. I felt like we were doing the same thing as conventional medicine. Instead of using meds, we're just putting them in the same buckets of nutrients and off they go. We would celebrate when they got better. And if they didn't get better, we were just like, oh, well, you know, they're not compliant or, you know, they're just too sick or, you know, we got to celebrate the, the, the wins here. I don't like it when, you know, my success rate is 70%. It just doesn't sit right with me. And we had a high success rate. I mean, 70, 80% success rate. But what about the 20, 30% who did not succeed? What's going on there? I remember when we gave these supplements to these people with heavy metals, I was on the environmental medicine shift a lot. And I worked with Dr. Bill Ray, who was one of the top environmental medical doctors in the world at his clinic in Dallas. He's since passed, but it was amazing working with him. People would have these reactions. I quickly asked, I said, do you think that their phase one detoxification systems are working really fast and their phase two detoxification systems in their liver can't keep up? And because I'm looking at the nutrients here, they're all supportive of phase one really, really well. But in terms of phase two, we have a insufficient nutrients to help move these chemicals out. So I think we're making a lot of our you know, patients worse. They're like, no, no, this has been tried and true. And this is, but I quickly learned that they were wrong and I was onto something. And then I said, okay, well, what about genetics? Because people get these red rashes or difficulty breathing from all this sulfur. And I said, well, I looked up sulfur uh, mechanisms in the human body. And it looks like there's this gene, sulfide oxidase, which processes sulfites. And molybdenum is a mineral that processes sulfites. And we're using DMSA, which is this pure sulfur compound to pull out mercury and lead. And in the beginning, they always do fine. 
but then they get worse and you have to discontinue treatment. I was like, doc, why don't we give them liquid molybdenum as a supplement? I bet they can tolerate it. He's like, no. I was like, it makes sense. We're overburdening this gene here. Let's give them the nutrient. So we actually did it on a member one patient. Their reactions went away. I learned in clinic quickly to support the individual. Genes matter. And it was just through the failures and not being happy with that, that it led me to digging deeper into the individual, which is why it's led me to strategy and dirty genes and understanding genetics in general. But you have to keep in mind the big picture. If you focus just on a particular gene without the big picture, you're also going to fail. You need all of it. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with Ben to give a shout out to our show partner, Bioptimizers. I take Bioptimizers Magnesium Breakthrough on a daily basis. Magnesium is one of the most important minerals for all aspects of health. It participates in over 600 different biochemical reactions. Magnesium deficiency can increase all disease risks and keep you from performing optimally. One of the biggest misconceptions about magnesium is that you just need more of it and you'll be healthy and optimized. But the truth is there are many different types of magnesium and each plays a critical role in different functions in your body. Magnesium Breakthrough contains seven forms of magnesium in one capsule. Bioptimizers has been around since 2004 and their products come with a 365 day money back guarantee. To get 10% off your Bioptimizers order, go to bioptimizers.com slash ultimate health. Again, that's bioptimizers.com slash ultimate health. And Bioptimizers is spelled B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Magnesium Breakthrough improves sleep quality, mood, and the body's ability to deal with stress. Give this incredible supplement a try today. And now back to my chat with Ben. Well, we got to talk about dirty genes. And I think it's important to start off, we talk about the dirty genes that we're born with versus the genes that are acting dirty. So break that down. So we have mom and dad. And, you know, our genes come from a man and woman. And we inherit whatever they have, and it becomes us. And we don't inherit the exact ones that they have because their genes have what's called epigenetic tags. So epigenetic tags is how, those, how the environment has influenced their genes to turn off or turn on and you know which speed in which these genes work. So we've inherited that. And then we're also in our own environment and our genes are responding to the own environment real time. So I'm looking outside. It's kind of a windstorm right now, but it's not crazy. I'm pretty calm. Um, but if there's a, you know, a jet bomber comes over and drops a bomb right in the lake in front of me, my genes are going to do something different. So we inherit these static genes for hair color, skin color, you know, eye color. These are pretty much static. We can't change that. And we inherit those. And then we have all these other genes that are very malleable and very adaptable. And so they can get overwhelmed or underwhelmed. Every gene has a job to do. And so if you understand the job of that particular gene, then you know how to support it. Like when that patient was taking all those sulfur-based supplements, maybe she did inherit a dirty sulfide oxidase gene from her parents. But actually, if you look in the research, inheriting a genetic variant in the sulfide oxidase gene, it's actually very, very rare. And it's very severe. It's identified at, almost at birth, newborns. So obviously, this person didn't inherit that sulfide oxidase genetic problem. But the sulfite oxidase gene needs molybdenum in order to function. But we wiped out the molybdenum because we gave that individual so much sulfur, which is not biologically typical in their diet. So we overloaded the system. And so their gene got dirty because it couldn't, didn't have the tools it needed to work. It's like you, you know, if you're running or exercising or you're maybe even sitting at your desk working or you're listening to this podcast, at the beginning of this podcast, you might be fine. But now you're getting a little bit more progressively tired as you go on. And either you're losing interest or you're using nutrition to support the neurotransmitters in your brain. You're actually using protein and vitamins to make the chemicals in your brain, which is allowing you to focus and think. And so if you're burning through that, and maybe you're exercising and jogging on the treadmill, why we're doing this, or on your bike, or you're in traffic and there's a lot going on in traffic. So you're focusing on that. You're burning even more nutrients. Maybe you haven't eaten yet today. Genes do work and they need tools to do it. So Regardless of how the genes are born, they need the support. And if you don't give it to them, you're going to get symptoms. And you talked about there how some genes are static, like our eye color, our hair color, versus the malleable ones. What is it about different genes that makes them fit into one of those categories? It's how they're expressed and if they're permanently turned off or not. You know, like 
the eye color gene, you know, I'm not a specialist on this, but I'm just, I'm just going to give it a, a wing it here. But eye color is, is happening in utero. And when that happens, you know, that gene is no longer expressing itself. It's just off. Most of our genes, Jesse, in our human body are off. They're turned off. It's like I have lights in my office right now. I can turn them on and they're hardwired, but I, I have the ability to turn them on and off. Some things in, in this home are fixed, like the siding of the house. It's fixed. It's done. It came here. It was delivered. It was cut and it was put on. Now nothing happens to it. It's done. But some things adjust as you need to. And the human body does not want to waste resources on genetic expression if it does not need to happen. It's very, very focused on conservation. Restoring and maintenance is already very expensive. I mean, we're we're rebuilding our entire stomach lining every week. That's a lot of stuff going on. You know, the saliva in our mouth, that's work. All the chemicals in our brain, that's work. The every breath that we're breathing in, there's chemicals. And our liver is processing all that. It's filtering it all out. So it's all work. If we're eating processed food with huge amounts of sugar and food coloring, you just gave your liver a huge workload. And if you're sitting behind a car stuck in traffic and inhaling exhaust and carbon monoxide, that's work too. If you take a shower or bathe in chlorine, or you're sitting in a hot tub with friends drinking a beer, and you're bathing in chlorine, you're doing more work for your genes again. So your genes do not want to be expressing themselves on jobs that they don't need to. So eye color and hair color, they're turned off. I mean, we have DNA in most of our cells in our human body. That DNA, depending on where it is, what target tissue it is, there are certain genes that are expressing. So I have heart cells in my heart, but there's still DNA right there for my eyes and my hairs and my bones in my heart, but they're off. And what are you seeing as being, you name some things that can happen in the environment that dirty our genes and cause them to shift and change the epigenetic changes. What are some of the top things that you're seeing environment-wise, lifestyle-wise that are having a negative impact on the genes? Air. I just posted yesterday on my Instagram (laughs) and also filled with some trolling afterwards. Uh, You know, I said, here we are so focused on COVID and uh, nearly 7 million people died last year from air pollution. 20% of babies, half a million of them, die from air pollution every year. This is every year. This is 2019. 500,000 babies died from air pollution. That's 20% of them of the deaths were caused by air pollution. That's a huge problem. And so infants do not have the ability to detoxify. Their livers are very, very underdeveloped. That's why they get jaundice. They can't handle it. And here we are, you know, where we spend a, a buddy of mine, Sean, talked about this. He goes, we focus so much attention on planning our wedding and spending so much money on our weddings and choosing the dress and choosing the site and choosing the silverware and the cards and the meals and the dessert and the cakes and the hairdos. But nobody's doing that when it comes to preparing the body for pregnancy. Pregnancy just happens and we take it for granted. And if it doesn't just happen, we just jump to IVF. And maybe some don't jump to IVF. And I'm not shaming people for that. But I'm just saying, well, you know, if you're infertile or you're struggling with pregnancy, there's something going on with your body that's preventing that from happening. You should really take a step back, not rush the pregnancy and figure out what it is because your baby is going to be in an environment that is probably not totally conducive for a totally healthy pregnancy because you're cutting some corners. And I understand too. I mean, if I was infertile or my wife was infertile, but I'm just saying that we need to really step back and look why we're not getting pregnant and think about it. But I would say the number one is air pollution. Another colleague of mine, Stephen Genius, um, uh, out of Canada, uh, environmental medical doc, he was an OBGYN. He stopped practicing as an OBGYN because he was so tired of delivering deformed, sick babies. And when he started doing questioning the parents, he learned that a lot of it was environmentally induced. And so he became an environmental medical specialist and and a very good one. So we breathe 11,000 liters of air every day, 11,000. And we worry about if our supplement has magnesium stearate in it, or we worry about what sunscreen preservative is in there, or if the chips, you know, are organic. These are all good concerns. But let's talk about big things first, air. 
I'm in my office right now. My desk is 100% wood. My floor is cork. My carpet is wool. My walls are made out of drywall that use a technology that absorb formaldehyde. It's called certainty. And it only costs 20% more. I have windows everywhere so I get natural light. I have double glazed windows to prevent Wi-Fi from coming in. I have metal roofing and metal siding to prevent Wi-Fi, or not Wi-Fi, but like 4G and 5G signals coming in. Our home is a bunker. We have filtered air coming in, being circulated through the building. I practice what I preach. Is it expensive? Yes, but it's what I value. And you mentioned a number of different things there you do in the home to prevent the toxins in the first place. And I think that's important to get to the root. But you also talked about the air filter too. And I'm curious, what type of air filter and how do we go about assessing the quality of the air that we currently have before filtering? You should hire specialists. Actually, in the appendix of of Dirty Genes, I talk about air quality testing and and, uh, water quality testing. I mean, there's certain organizations, you know, more USA though, I don't, I don't know Canada, but uh, yeah, you test and then you, you do your research on, on products and you hire experts who know more than you. So, I mean, I had experts come in here for water filtration. I had experts come in on air filtration. I had experts come in on, um, you know, EMF signals. And I thought what he was doing was completely wacko, you know, but again, you put the trust forward first and then if it failed, then I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to trust this. But I have a, you know, an audience to support. And so I had him come and he tested the amount of EMF signals in the home and they were really high. And for some reason, we're in a concentrated area. And I don't know if it's because we're on a lake and the signals come in and they bounce off the lake or, or what, and they never dissipate or die. I have no idea. Near cell phone tower we have is about a half mile away. But uh, he did testing and he mitigated it. And he goes, the aluminum siding is going to be great. I just got lucky. Double glazed windows would be great. I did that for solar protection. So I got lucky with that. And then the metal roofing, I also got lucky with that. So all the things there. But then he also got this paint from Austria. This is black paint and you paint the walls black. So everything's black. And then you choose your paint color over that. For the electrical signal, he put down this like chicken wire on the floor before our primary or main floor were put in. And then you ground it to a ground in one of the outlets. And then you put your floor on top of that. He's like, this is really important for magnetism and, and not magnetism, but you know, electrical fields. You don't want to, you don't want to be sleeping on electrical fields. It's not good. And um, he came back and retested everything. And I was blown away. His meter was like zero in terms of EMF. His meter was zero in terms of magnetism and zero, literally zero for electrical fields. And he placed it right on the ground. And we had before as well. And he would go in a different room right outside the, the bedroom doors in the lobby, kind of foyer of where the boys um, walked to different rooms and it was reacting. It was a lot of act- electrical activity on the floor. And he, right inside the door where we put the mat, zero. You know, we're electrical beings. We can't forget that. We talk about electrolytes, you know, and drink electrolytes. We know that word electrolytes, but we don't understand that every single one of our cells is has huge amounts of potassium inside our cells and huge amounts of magnesium inside our cells and sodium and chloride on the outside. And uh, it actually takes work to pump the magnesium potassium inside of our cell takes 40% of our energy at rest, Jesse, 40% of our energy at rest to pump magnesium and potassium inside of our cell. Remember, the body is trying to be very, very efficient, but 40% of our energy is used for our electrolytes and we're surrounded with EMF. Come on. And for somebody who maybe, you know, at the time doesn't have access to somebody to come in and, and check the home or maybe the finances. Can you recommend a specific air filter that you've, you know, went through and, and tested and used plus yeah. water filtration? Because again, these are, I find so much that on the podcast, we're talking about diet and exercise, but oftentimes we don't talk about things like air quality. You're mentioning EMFs and water quality, and these are big ones too. Yeah. So let's talk about for somebody that's, you know, just getting into this and they want to have a starting place to at least do some research. What kind of brands are you using? Well, number one, avoidance is first. So don't even run out and buy stuff. Avoidance is number one. Stop bringing in fragrances into your home. Get rid of the dryer sheets that you use that you throw in the dryer to make your clothes smell good. Clean is the absence of smell, not the presence of some artificial smell. Clean is the absence of smell. I don't use deodorant or laundry soap. Is this really cool 
paper that you just rip. It's just concentrated natural stuff. I found it on Instagram actually, and uh, it's amazing. But avoidance is key. You know, our intake for the air of our home, because in America, or at least Washington State here, you know, new home construction requires input air and then exhaust air. And so where do you put the air to get sucked in? So we positioned it in an area where that's clean. And they originally going to stick it, you know, on the opposite side over here, which is right next to where our neighbor exhausts their furnace. So you have to do your due diligence. Okay, well, where is this air coming from? When you're sitting in the car, you put your air on recycle when you're stuck in traffic or going up hills or you're behind a stinky car. When you're going on the flat or downhill, this car in front of you, you can get some fresh air coming in. I'm always hitting that recycle on and off for airflow in the vehicles constantly. Windows are up, windows are down. So I'm very mindful of my exposures because it's work for your body. You're dirtying your genes. So if you, you reduce the workload, it's like if for customer service, if I create a good product and I have good information about it, my customer service doesn't have to worry about it. They don't get calls. But if I create a product that's faulty or has issues, I'm going to be on the phone all the time and I'm going to be overworking it. But in, to answer your question directly, avoidance is number one. So anything's better than what you got. If you cannot afford at the moment something great, um, either focus on your avoidance and save up for something that will be great or you know, work your way up in level. So I like Allen air for air filtration for local air. So if you can't filter your whole whole home air, Allen air, A-L-E-N air is great. I don't know if they're in Canada or not, but we have one in the gym. We got inundated with forest fire smoke here. So I put that in there as well. And then your furnace. If you have a gas furnace in your home, you can upgrade your filter in there. And so just pull out your furnace filter and look at it and get a highest MERV rating you can. So I think it's MERV 13. That is the highest you can get. It filters out viruses and bacteria and dander and pollen, all that. If you're trying to save money on a furnace filter and you look at it and it's like you can almost see through it and it's aluminum and it's just terrible and there's just dust on it, you got to level up. Is that MERV 13 a replaceable or one that you can clean and reuse? It's replaceable. Okay. Yeah, they're replaceable. There are some filters that you can clean and reuse, but ultimately, I don't know how I feel about that. So we have HEPA air, air filtration too in our home. We use a system called Life Breath. And uh, so if you're doing heating and cooling, it's new. Um, you can tack on a Life Breath system and get a HEPA air filtration. So we have actual HEPA filtration in our home. In this building in my office, I don't. And you can just get these air filters locally in your room or wherever you spend the most of your time and you can even move them around. So, you know, if you can just get one, you know, wherever you are in your home, just pick it up and, and carry it to somewhere else. But Allen Air, I love because they're, they're big, they're quiet, um, and you can get really high quality filters with them as well. And their website's really good. You're mentioning ducks. Talk more about that. So when you have air furnaces and you have forced air heating, um, our downstairs still has that. I wanted to get, you know, water tubes in the floor for heating those and creating, you know, warmth that way. But it wasn't possible because it was a remodel. So uh, we have forced air still downstairs. Upstairs, we have these local, uh, see these units, the Mitsubishi, and there's little filters in those too. And that can heat or cool. And I can regulate it with just a remote, which is pretty handy. And it's specific to each room. But uh, ducts are the tubes that you have under your house in your crawl space or your basement. So they're carrying the, the heated air and they go through the register and they blast into your home. You got to call a duct cleaning company, D-U-C-T, have them come out and vacuum out your ducts and make sure you ask them to don't put any chemicals down there. You know, I want to know what you're putting down there first. You know, in, in, they have little cameras. They can spot mold, they can spot standing water, they can spot mice, you know, rodent poop, pee, whatever. But you got to get your ducts cleaned. And that is really, really, really important because otherwise you're blowing all sorts of nasty stuff down there. But home construction is a major, major issue. And if you're not in a home, if you're in apartments or, um, or renting a house, you know, you got to look for water damage. And uh, it's a huge, huge science. And then in terms of water filtration, anything is better than nothing. I don't know who did it. I, I think it was um, Mike Adams of naturalnews.com. I think he compared various water filters and he did a really, really good job. 
Brita was pretty garbage, B-R-I-T-A, but it still did something. Um, but actually, Brita is very expensive. You think it's cheap, but it's actually really expensive because you have to replace those cartridges pretty often. And then if you don't replace those cartridges, what you're doing is those cartridges are getting so saturated, you're putting the stuff right back into your water and they're getting mold and all sorts of gunks. You got to replace your filters and put notices on your phone or your calendar to remind you. In fact, I got I bought new filters already for our under sink water filters and uh, I need to remove those and put them in. You can also go on Amazon and you can read some research uh, reviews on those, but be careful on Amazon or any websites because fake reviews are huge nowadays. Amazon is ripe with fake reviews. I used to go on Amazon years ago and see a product had 600 reviews and I quickly read the negative ones because I don't care about the positives, just like the cases. It's awesome that patients got better, but I want to know who didn't. But read the negative reviews first that's going to be more telling than the positive reviews with the fake reviews out and about now. It's a huge problem. That makes sense. And when it comes to water filtration for our home, we're using a Berkey system with the added arsenic and fluoride filters and for our shower filters too. That's another important thing to point out. We're using the Berkey yes. filters in the showers. And again, I want to caveat too onto what you said. You got to make sure you're changing these things and cleaning these things because it's one thing to put them in and it's great. But you need a reminder system so you can make sure you're changing them on a regular basis. Yeah. And your fridge water filter too. You know, don't just turn off the alarm to replace the ice making, you know, water filter. Get down there and, and buy it and have extras. So I buy four at a time and, uh, you know, I just leave them up on top and I replace them every six months. Because if you don't have it and it's beeping, you know, you're just going to go on about your time. And so I have replacement, you know, it filters already in the crawl space for the furnace in the box. And I have replacement filters downstairs. I have replacement water filters already. So I already have stuff. And when I use it, I'm going to buy the replacements again. So don't buy the replacements, put them in and not be ready for next time. So as you're focusing on it, just do it all at once. And coming back to the air, one thing people can start doing right away as they're listening to this when they go and cook their next meal is turn on the fan above the oven especially if you're using gas. Yes. And I got to admit, we're guilty of not using that very often because it is noisy and we have a baby and a dog and we don't want to work everybody up. But I got to get better about using that because it's installed right above the stove. And with all those oils being heated and, you know, you get some smoke sometimes, you want to make sure you're not just standing over the stove and breathing that in. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, cooking, and I talk about this in the Dirty Jeans course, and I, I show research, restaurants are actually high levels of formaldehyde in the air. And their Chinese and Japanese restaurants or in Korean barbecue restaurants are really toxic air because they don't have enough hoods being used. And you're doing the same thing in your own home. Indoor air is typically way more toxic than the outdoor air. Here we are worrying about forest fires. I think I quoted this in the, in the course, traffic in LA is terrible. And there's all sorts of pollution from that. Inside people's homes is worse in LA. It's worse than the I-5 freeway. And a lot of that's from cooking. A lot of that's from being cheap and, and buying press board furniture. Go to Goodwill, you know, go to, you know, thrift stores and, and find used all wood furniture. Or if you can't find the used all wood furniture, at least find the used garage sale press board furniture that is already off gassed. If you do that, you're getting way less exposure. People will move into their newly remodeled home all excited and get themselves sick because they've cut corners. I use the more expensive plywood on this home. We didn't use that OSB, you know, glued together plywood. We use the real plywood and uh, it's way less uh, toxic. I did shortcuts back on our old home in my office and I used the OSB plywood and it was releaching formaldehyde and I sit there and, and I got sick. So, you know, you've got to invest in some things and then while you're investing in these things, you cut out other things. We didn't go out to eat for years, years. We never went out to eat. I mean, never went out to eat because we saved for growing the business and we saved for remodeling the home. Our clothes came from, you know, Goodwill or Costco. I mean, this is this is like 15 bucks from Costco. There's no, no name brand on this thing. Priorities. You have to yeah. have them in the right place. That's right. Ben, I know I've already kept you long on this call and, and I've really enjoyed every minute. We shared so much great stuff and I really thank you. So I want to respect your time, let you go. But before we do that, how can the listeners connect with you after the show? Huh. I would say you can find me on Facebook and, and Instagram and YouTube, but I am shadow banned. So you can still find me there. 
after you follow me, I don't know if you're going to be notified of if I post. So seekinghealth.com is where you can you know, find my products and newsletters there from Seeking Health. But also if you go to Dr. Ben Lynch, you can sign up for newsletters. And uh, if you go to my Instagram, Dr. Ben Lynch, you go to my profile and click the link there. You can subscribe to my newsletter. It's free and, and uh, I'm starting to write more and more now since I'm not on social media. So I will have to say it, it's, it's good being shadow banned in a sense because it's redirecting my priorities to emailing people versus just ignoring that. Like I said, people, you know, I got a, over a hundred thank you letters for our last newsletter that I wrote for people. So it's good. My newsletter is just like we're having right now. It's like a full on discussion. You found the silver lining. And Ben, I want to leave the listeners with a quote from your book, an optimistic quote that summarizes everything we were talking about today. And that's your genes won't stop writing until the day you die. But what they write is up to you. Very empowering, very optimistic. And I just think that's a good way to summarize and and leave this discussion. Perfect. Love it. Anything you want to share before we part ways? Let's leave them with that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ben. This was great. I really enjoyed that conversation with Ben and I hope you got a lot from it. I'd love to hear what you thought of the conversation over on Instagram. You can tag Dr. Ben Lynch and at Ultimate Health Podcast. You can take a screenshot of the players you're listening. Be sure and tag us in the photo and we'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatepodcast.com slash 394. There's links there to everything we discussed today and so much more. Be sure and check those out. And before I let you go, I want to give some love to my editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Thank you, Jace. And thank you for listening to the show. Have an awesome week. I'll talk to you soon. Wishing you ultimate health.